Okay, well, we were up to uh, 75 people. Um, so we have a really good group. And I want to thank everybody so much for joining us this morning. We're um, really pleased to have with us uh, members of Minnesota's congressional delegation to talk about infrastructure. And uh, since uh, this is a big topic this week, and we hope that uh, this will be better than some of the past infrastructure weeks. Um, we're really pleased to um, have with us Representative Pete Stauber, who does serve on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, so we're really uh, happy about that and grateful that you uh, chose to be on that committee. Um, so I'm Margaret Donahoe. I'm the director of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance. And um, I just wanted to say that while we would much rather meet with you in person, uh, we know we have to do this for now, uh, but we are planning to, with any luck, uh, be out in DC in September for our fly-in, which we have scheduled for September 21st to the 23rd. So maybe we will be able to see you in person then. And uh, we just really appreciate your support uh, for all of the transportation needs in Minnesota. I'm sure you um, understand uh, better than anybody in the 8th District all the needs, whether it's roads, bridges, ports, rail, airports, all of that infrastructure. And uh, the shortfall that we have in Minnesota for funding these projects, which was exacerbated with COVID, so uh, as you know, we're all very uh, concerned about making progress and the fact that the FAST Act expires at the end of September. So we're really anxious to hear from you what you think uh, the prospects are for getting uh, the FAST Act reauthorized and not just extended and to have an increase in revenue for transportation, especially with the challenges with the Federal Highway Trust Fund and what you see happening. So without any further ado, uh, I'm gonna welcome Representative Pete Stauber and thank you again so much for being here. Well, thank you, Margaret. It's great to be with you all today. And uh, as I'm traveling through the district, uh, you know, I, I would just like to say that, you know, the uh, my predecessor, some of you have heard me say this, my predecessor, uh, Congressman Jim Overstar, who was the transportation chair, uh, said this, and I'm going to attribute uh, this comment to him. There's not a Republican road or a Democrat road. Uh, the roads for us all to safely travel on. And that's the philosophy that we need to have as we enter um, the talks and legislation in the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. I do have, uh, I do believe that Chairman DeFazio and Ranking Member uh, Sam Graves um, are going to lead a, what I hope is a healthy discussion on the investments into our infrastructure, as you talked about the FAST Act, we uh, we have to um, find a way uh, to to make make sure that the investments are there for um, our uh, you know roads and bridges, and and also we, we can include uh, in part broadband into that because uh, we know that uh, the rural America is, is, it needs it, and it, it, it makes sense that we're going to redo the roads to possibly if we're going to bury broadband. Uh, cables or, or the uh, fiber or uh, you know put it on uh, uh, towers etc these are some discussions we're having we want to maximize the uh, investments of the tax dollars and from from my, my history as a Hermantown city councilor and as a St. Louis County commissioner as a, the board chair of transportation um, I, I understand the importance of making sure that the investment is there and the investment is there early so you can start planning because when we plan um, then the, when the federal government plans rather those local communities and counties can also plan for projects nearby or in conjunction with which helps them save money as, as well so um, I, I will just say that uh, from from my perspective um, we've had a really really good working relationship uh, with uh, MnDOT and the other professionals um, in that arena and the engineers um, in, in the arena of uh, building roads and, roads and bridges and, and making sure our infrastructure uh, is, is better than it uh, was even 10 years ago. It is our, in my mind, it is our generation's responsibility now to replace this. Uh, many, uh, we know that uh, 
when we invest in the, in the roads and bridges, we have the ability to uh, uh, actually save, uh, for instance, save uh, uh, gas for the vehicles that maybe couldn't go on a, a bridge because the weight was too, uh, you know, uh, too big for that particular bridge, the, the weight limit. So we know that we can do that. And I really trust the professionals that did that. You know, we have, uh, I predominantly was a district one with uh, Dwayne Hill, uh, our relationship. And I think that all uh, congressional offices need to have that relationship with the transportation directors and those leaders of those districts because um, you have to break down the silos and then invest when we can. I, I, I'm optimistic that we're going to find a way uh, to fund uh, our transportation that we desperately need in transportation projects. You know, we could wrap off those in the 8th district uh, uh, that require or uh, that are going to require some uh, heavy investments. But it's needed, and uh, so my job is to make sure that we get to the table. We have those discussions. We understand that uh, that uh, in negotiations, one side is not going to get everything they want, and uh, when we realize that, and then put forth the energy to make sure these projects uh, are completed, and and the priority projects, uh, you know, with uh, not only. Uh, end up at the priority projects that are in conjunction with the counties and the cities and the townships. We can, we can do a lot of good work and that's my goal is just to see and try to lead those discussions to make sure the investments there, uh, you know, not only for Minnesota, but our entire nation. And, uh, and so that, that's kind of my philosophy going forward. As a, a member of the TNI committee, uh, I'm very proud of you. Minnesota 8 has all forms of transportation, and I think that's why uh, the, the member in the 8th district uh, since uh, uh, John Blotnick has been on the transportation infrastructure committee because it's an important part of our of who we are and uh, getting uh, commerce to and from. So uh, I'm going to be heavily involved in the, uh, the discussions, and I just uh, we need to we need to make sure the funding's there, and uh, so there could be planning. Uh, everybody involved so i guess margaret with that i'll i'll you know i'll, t I'll take questions or, or comments from the professionals on this, on this call ah uh, thank you so much um so for those on the call uh please put questions in the chat box and uh we'll try to get to all the questions we can um, I know there is some um, concern about, uh, you know, the the infighting, I guess, between um, the House and Senate and different, or not House and Senate, but Democrats and Republicans as far as how to address this issue that has led to some gridlock in the past. And um, just wondering what you think in terms of how this will play out with the administration's uh announcement tomorrow i guess about a big infrastructure package um do you see this being sort of broken apart into pieces or do you see um this more expansive than the traditional surface transportation that it would include like broadband and other kinds of infrastructure i think it's going to uh, first off uh, the way congress is working um, it's broken, it's divided. Um, and I'll just give you an example. The, the first five COVID related packages through the House and Senate were bipartisan, worked together. The 1.9 trillion that we just voted on was purely partisan with zero minority input. That's not what the communities, that, that, that's not what the country wants. So um, I have, like I say, the chairman, the leadership of the chairman, I know Peter DeFazio uh, very well, I know Sam Graves very well. My hope is that we can bring a project uh, that's beneficial and is it a bipartisan work um, that's where you get success and, uh, and not only infrastructure projects but that's where you get success in the government working across the aisle and making sure that the minority is heard and uh, you know bringing their views into the conversation and into the legislation um, but we'll see whether it's broke up or not it may be um, but I do, I, I do think that having that bipartisan conversation is really good because uh, some of the legislation we've seen already, um, 
that were voted on the 117th Congress has been purely partisan. Uh, it's not effective. It's not uh, good for the nation. And it's not good to shut out the minority voices. So that's the goal, uh, you know, to, to be able to. And really, the big, the elephant is in the room is how to, to pay for it. Um, we need to. Uh, we need to make sure that that the pay fors are, are legitimate. That, that, that the pay fors can actually do. Uh, to be paid for and i think that uh, uh my goal is to continue continue those discussions and, and hope that we can come together and bring a transportation bill uh that that's beneficial to the entire country not one or the other political party and like i say having been the transportation director or the chair for st louis county which had six thousand lane miles of roads I, I have a really, really good understanding how important the infrastructure was and the safety of the traveling motors and how important that was uh, for for all of us. So whether that that uh, whether it's going to be split up, it, it remains to be seen at this point. Well, of course, um, a project that's near and dear to your heart, I'm sure, is um, the Blotnick Bridge. And uh, a lot of folks are wondering about trying to find funding for that. Uh, but also just kind of the earmarking process in general. It sounds like there might be more of an opportunity for members to direct funds to specific projects. How do you see that working through your office? Uh, let's talk about the Blotnick Bridge. We know that uh, that's uh, you know that's down the road but it's not down the road that you know that far we know that uh the talk is at least replaced but before we could do the blotnik bridge we have to uh, get the TPI, yeah, the twin ports interchange done first we have to make sure that the money is there first uh, because that's uh that's what's going to connect the, the blotnik that's what's going to connect uh, uh the uh the, the duluth port uh, with the goods that come out of there to be able to transfer, like the windmills, to be able to get them when they come into port, to be able to get them uh, on the trucks in, in, in a safe and, and, and easily way out of uh, you know out of the port. Uh, so the twin ports interchange has to be uh, completed, has to be funded, and then uh, right behind that will be uh, will be uh, the Blotnick Bridge endeavor with the uh, state of Wisconsin. So. Those things uh, we're looking forward to. Uh, we're looking forward to those projects to be completed in the years to come. Uh, in reference to earmarks, uh, those federally uh, directed projects or those federally uh, you know, uh, priority uh, projects, our office is still working throughout the, you know, throughout the district on, uh, on the projects that are priorities for. And, uh, and the other officials on how we can you know, work and how we can make sure that those projects, uh, selecting officials on those, on those projects, understand the importance and the priorities. Uh, one of the examples uh, given to us was uh, out of upstate New York. It was a, it was a, it was a uh, FAA project, the Federal Aviation Project, and uh, it put the airport couldn't understand why they, they didn't get their money. They met all the criteria, and it was a it was a young individual that was that was sorting out which projects were a priority. They backtracked it to that, and I I don't want uh, projects that are a priority for our state to have um, to have a young individual deciding what project is priority. Maybe it doesn't in their own mind, or or maybe the 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 application, for example, there was a, a minor change or, or something missing, so it goes to the shelf. We don't want that. We want to uh, work together and find these projects that are that are a priority for us. We know through crash data, uh, through other data, that that we can we can we know what roads, what bridges uh, that we uh, we need to invest in, and you do that with collaborating those professionals, the engineers. And, and like I say, I, I always call Dwayne Hill out because uh, he's in our district and he does a fantastic job 
reaching out to the communities. And, and, and that's that's what I expect on, on those uh, federally directed projects, that there's collaboration, there's uh, conversation and talk, and, uh, and then you make the decision to invest. And we're at this, at this moment, we're still, still sorting all that out. Um, and being the only uh, uh, individual on transportation infrastructure in the state, I want to, you know, not only um, work on the 8th district, there's, there's going to be uh, projects uh, in the other seven districts that, that are a priority. And I want to listen to your, your directors and the professionals and, and advocate for those projects as well, because they're the priority. And so um, as we go forward, I think you're going to see uh, more advocacy from, from the members of Congress to be able to help prioritize uh, the projects that, that, that are needed and, and really have, through collaboration have been prioritized. Great. Um, well, I just wanted to ask one final question because I know um, Representative Emmer has also joined us, but um, we also want to make sure that uh, transit is on the radar. So I uh, just wanted to ask a little bit about funding for transit, especially in greater Minnesota. And um, I know there's been concern about the mileage reimbursement for volunteer drivers and just wondering yes. if that's something you're thinking about with all of this. Well, it's, I'm doing more than thinking about the mileage reimbursement because uh, we're actually uh, signing on to support the additional mileage reimbursement for those volunteer drivers. You know, those of us who represent rural areas uh, such as Minnesota's 8th Congressional District, we know that that uh, that those volunteer drivers and the services are extremely important. They help our seniors and others stay in their homes longer, and that's where they're most uh, the most happy happy and i think that we have the ability uh to look at that i i've, I've uh, supported initiatives of, of uh, increasing those mileage reimbursements and and the, the, their volunteer drivers they they, they want to be paid uh you know the mileage that they should be paid and i agree with that especially for like i say rural areas not only of minnesota but uh, from you know throughout the nation that is important and it's extremely important that that we have make sure that our, our seniors in particular and our elders and those with special needs have the ability um, to get uh, have a safe ride to where they need to go, whether it's appointments, shopping, etc. And so, rural, um, you know, rural America, rural Minnesota, uh, is it, it's extremely important that we have we allow the ability for those living there to have the. Uh, have transportation, uh, safe transportation uh, to and from. So I, I, I'm passionate about that because I know that our seniors, uh, that's one of their bigger, one of their bigger concerns, uh, trying to stay in their homes. And if we can allow them to stay in their homes to be happy and healthier there, I think it's a win-win. Great. Well, thank you so much. And also thank you for the funding in the COVID packages that has helped uh, transportation yeah. in Minnesota. We definitely appreciate that. And we look forward to working with you throughout the summer and uh, hopefully there'll be some progress and we hope to see you in September out in Washington. That sounds good to take care everyone. Have a great day. Uh, it was a pleasure to be with you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, so I do believe uh, that we are also fortunate to have um, Representative Tom Emmer joining us. Uh, we really appreciate Representative Emmer being here. Um, as you know, he represents the 6th District in Minnesota and has been a big champion for transportation projects in Minnesota. So uh, thank you, Representative Emmer, for being here, and I will turn it over to you to talk about, from your perspective, how you see this infrastructure package and how we can reauthorize the FAST Act and really make progress in this area. Well, thank you, Margaret. And thanks uh, uh, everybody for, uh, for doing this uh, unique uh, Transportation Alliance, uh, uh, what, congressional visit. I really appreciate it. Obviously, uh, Margaret, our office had some uh, significant success last uh, cycle. Uh, we uh, managed to pick up $15 million for Highway 10 and another 40 million for the uh, Highway 10 and 169 
uh, uh, interchange. We've also uh, reintroduced uh, something that we've been championing for the last uh, four years, which I hope is going to get uh, get some play. The National Interchange Intersection Safety Construction Program Act, which prioritizes funding for intersections and interchanges to improve safety and uh, increases. This would increase local control over the federal transportation dollars. Uh, you probably uh, remember I've talked about this in the past. I think Highway 10 is a great example of where this type of money could be used, but we've got several others in uh, the 6th Congressional District and across Minnesota where it'd be very important. Also introduced the National Bridge Replacement and Improvement Act, which would create a grant program for bridge improvements, replacements, uh, and or repairs. Uh, and there's all kinds of other things that we can talk about, but let's talk about this, uh, this cycle. Uh, we've got this infrastructure package that's coming. I don't know what other people are, uh, are telling you, but the, uh, uh, the hope, and I've been saying this since the beginning of the session, that we could get past this partisan uh, divide by not making the mistake that the Obama administration made uh, and the Trump administration. Uh, they should have led with major infrastructure bills in both of those administrations. I think uh, those of us that have been involved in elective politics in Minnesota, uh, several of you on this call uh, and myself, we've known each other for years. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an area where we typically find agreement, right? And uh, I don't care who uh, is in uh, the, uh, the Oval Office, Republican or Democrat, I, I just think in the, the world that we live in right now, uh, transportation, uh, the infrastructure, you know, I, I, I look at it, by the way, as broadband literally being above the whole thing now, the umbrella, uh, especially with the pandemic. Uh, you've got to build out the broadband just as much as you got to repair our uh, interstate highway system, just as much as you've got to uh, improve uh, our, uh, our airports and our seaports. And this is huge stuff, and uh, it's something that Republicans and, and Democrats typically agree on. I'm afraid, though, that uh, what we're going to see, uh, if it's handled the way the first two things have been handled this Congress, it's not going to have the outcome that we want. Uh, what needs to happen is it needs to be bipartisan. It needs to have Republican uh, ideas included in it. And by the way, it needs to have moderate Democrats ideas included in it too. I, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, but that $1.9 trillion, uh, uh, and I disagree with it being called the Restore America Act, that 91% of it had nothing to do with COVID. And we still had a trillion dollars out there uh, uh, that had yet to be uh, implemented from the previous uh, two uh, COVID relief bills. Uh, but here's the problem. I, I don't bring it up to get into a partisan uh, uh, disagreement. I bring it up because that bill, that $1.9 trillion, went through the House. Not one Republican amendment was, uh, was accepted uh, or welcomed. Uh, by the way, neither were Democrats able to amend that bill. Think about that for a second. Uh, the uh, chair, ch chairman and chairwomen uh, on the Democrat side for these different committees were not allowed to amend their own bill. So talk about it being, uh, being a problem. If that happens with the transportation bill, I, I think uh, those of us that have worked together in the past, uh, uh, Terrell, it, you know already that will be a problem. Because if you and I were uh, in a perfect world, if you and I were on opposite sides of this with a, a Democrat uh, uh, endorsement and a Republican endorsement, we'd sit down and go, yeah, it's transportation, right? Uh, we we got to figure out how to move forward uh, with uh, improvements, road improvements, bridge improvements, uh, intersection repairs. By the way, transit, uh, we've got to look at how we, uh, in, in our these urban areas that You've got populations that you need to move to and from, uh, you know, work uh, and the things that they need. These are things that we would talk about and we'd get resolved. Uh, if, if we could possibly have that kind of play, I'd be really excited. Here's what I'm afraid of, and I'm just going to warn you up front. Uh, there is a, uh, and you guys all know, there's a, uh, like the far right, there is a far left that in order to get this through the House, they may force many things that Republicans just can't vote for. That would be a problem. 
because this should be the answer to uh, this uh, partisanship. It should be the, uh, the bridge, forgive me for using that term, but uh, between the two parties where we can actually get something done and it's productive uh, for our communities and for our country. Uh, it should be major broadband expansion. Uh, I, I think everything's gonna run off that. And then it should be an all of the above, just like we talk with uh, energy. It should be an all of the above uh, uh, program when it comes to transportation. I, I don't think we should be favoring one over another because everything is important depending on where you're, where you're looking. The good news is that Congress has taken back its Article I spending authority. Okay, I, some people might call them earmarks. Uh, and we can have a big disagreement uh, when we get to uh, uh, the election over, you know, who did it and what they are. But I, Joe Persky knows that ever since I ran for this office, I thought that was a mistake. That Congress had abdicated its constitutional responsibility to literally direct, direct, limited resources to specific projects. I, it, uh, you remember the bridge to nowhere is what got all the play, but it's. Uh, you can do this, a, a, a hockey rink, God bless uh, the greatest sport ever invented, but a hockey rink is a luxury. That is not transportation infrastructure. That's not, you know, that's something that uh, we should not be directing these dollars to. But you know what? If there's a road or a bridge in my district, I absolutely should be able to use the influence that I've built over the last uh, three terms to leverage it and get that, uh, that money into our district because I think it's a priority. Uh, that's back. So uh, we do have some uh, some hope on the horizon, and I hope cooler heads will start to prevail uh, in the uh, the Democrats uh, on the other side that are transportation advocates and are reasonable human beings. I hope uh, they can get together with reasonable Republicans and make this thing move. And I'll stop. Take whatever questions you guys have. Great. Well, thank you so much. Well, I know there are folks who have projects in your district, like Highway 55 and Highway 212 and other kind of freight corridors. And so one of the questions is, you know, we've had build, we've had infra, we've had these other discretionary grant programs. Do you see those continuing with the earmarks or is it one going to replace the other? <laughs> No, I, I think you're going to see programs continue. Uh, the question is, what's the title? You know, they, they've changed uh, the names over time, right? Tiger Grants, uh, FAST, uh, the FAST money. Uh, I do believe that uh, this is one of the most important issues for every member of Congress. I mean, look, if you can come back to your district and you can tell them that, look what I was able to uh, bring home. I, it's not... Uh, uh, earmarks, as they call it, it, they got the bad name. It's what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and I, I think uh, I think those programs will exist, Margaret. I don't know at what level, uh, but they're not going to get rid of them. They've been very popular and they uh, it gives the administration a little bit more control, right? So they like that. Uh, and I don't think we should take that away from them, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, and then we just enhance it now by restoring our authority that we're supposed to be uh, be uh, supposed to be leveraging. I think it's also going to help people run the house, right? Because it's not uh, an earmark, and there's nothing wrong with a leader in a house going to a member and saying, "Okay, look, I've got these ten projects. They're all really important. Okay, uh, you have to decide." Uh, I got to figure out if you're with us or you're against us. I got to figure out uh, where these are in the priority list. They're all good projects, but we only have so much. And so we're going to help people who help us. Right. And then you just don't lose your core. Know what you're there for. Know who you represent uh, and make sure that you represent their voices the way they expect you to represent them. So. I think those programs will continue, Margaret. I think they'll be uh, renewed. We're gonna have a major problem on the horizon though with our debt, right? And at some point, uh, these uh, modern monetary theorists uh, who uh, are just uh, fancy uh, titled, uh, uh, what do you wanna call them, uh, dreamers, uh, they think that we can just uh, incur all kinds of debt and we're just gonna write it off at some point. 
by the way, I think the last administration was the same way. <laughs> it's uh, that's the, the discussion we're going to have to have going forward. And uh, I just think when it comes to transportation and communication in this country, uh, that's what makes commerce goes. That's what makes our uh, quality of life. And we got to make sure that those are the areas that we continue to focus on. Well, along those lines, there has been some discussion about a, maybe a pilot for a mileage based user fee or some kind of uh, way to help this insolvency of the highway trust fund. Do you see something like that being part of this? I, personally, no. I know you guys would advocate for it, but uh, I think it's going to run into constitutional concerns. Uh, a mileage, uh, uh, doing it that way is going to affect those that can't afford, that can afford it the least. Uh, it also runs into uh, concerns that our Supreme Court has had in the past with the right to travel, right? Uh, it's, uh, I, I think we're better off putting the, uh, and I've said this for the last three terms, the Highway Trust Fund, if it would do what it was intended to do, which is fund highways, uh, this is what it was created for. Have it focus on that and all the other things that we put into it over the years, let's find alternative funding sources that, that fit those. Republicans and Democrats agree on user fees, right? Uh, the problem though with a mileage reimbursement, I, I'm willing to talk about it, Margaret. Uh, I just think it's gonna run into some uh, issues when it comes to those uh, constitutional concerns. And then you're gonna run into that part of society that uh, you know uh, we have uh, in the sixth district uh, quite a bit that uh, they don't want their government tracking them. And they believe that all of this is, uh, is connected to that. Remember, uh, the conspiracy theorists in America are not diminishing, they are growing. So uh, we got to figure out how to, how to communicate this so people, uh, people understand we're all trying to get to where we all want to be. But I think it's going to run into some, uh, some difficulties uh, uh, with those different constituencies, but certainly happy to talk about it. Maybe there's a way to overcome it. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I know apparently there has been some uh, talk from the administration about not supporting uh, a mileage based user fee or an increase in the gas tax and maybe looking more at um, taxes on corporations. Um, I know the issue of bringing businesses back to the United States has been uh, talked about in the past as maybe a way to generate more revenue. Um, do you see some of those kinds of strategies involved here? Yeah, I, I would have supported that. That was uh, something we were advocating for with the last administration when they made the mistake of trying to uh, address our healthcare situation first, healthcare and taxes. They should have let off with transportation. I, I think you might have had breakthroughs in both of the other areas uh, and this, this idea that we were going to uh, give uh, US-based corporations and or uh, corporations that had done the, uh, uh, you know, what uh, Boston Scientific did with Covidian, uh, give them an opportunity to return, right? Bring their, uh, their operations back to this country and charge them, right? Give them, uh, rather than uh, uh, having this high corporate rate, you bring the rate down, but then you have a surcharge that's directed specifically to transportation because that's their, that's what's important to move commerce, move their product uh, and deliver their services. So I, I think if this administration heads in that direction, uh, there's probably gonna be a good conversation. But Margaret, keep in mind, I, it's, this isn't a Democrat Republican division. I mean, you can find some, but this is really internal to both parties. Both parties are struggling with this uh, when they sit down and talk about how we fund it, because there isn't one perfect answer, which is why I think we should start tailoring it to whatever we're, we're talking about doing, right? Uh, the uh, three cents that was uh, created back under the Eisenhower administration to fund the, the uh, highway trust fund to build the interstate uh, uh, transportation system was great, but we've all been avoiding taking it to the next step and saying, okay, so, What's, what's a creative way that we can, uh, we can build in for the future for airports, for our seaports? I mean, you know all the things that we are losing right now because we don't have ports that are deep enough? I mean, the Suez Canal uh, should teach us something about uh, what, uh, what we're facing in this country. Uh, so, and it's the same thing with the, uh, the broadband, right? 
And I know there are great ideas on our transportation committee on both sides of the aisle. And I think the, the White House should probably start listening to them. And I think Nancy should allow both the Democrat leading the, the Fazio and uh, uh, Sam Graves to actually collaborate. Because I think you'd, you'd find that there's some ideas that cross for both Republicans and Democrats when it comes to funding transportation. Right. Well, thank you so much. I know you need to get going. And um, we have been joined now by uh, Representative Hagedorn. So um, again, I want to thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you in person in September at our fly-in in DC. Um, I can't wait. Yeah, exactly. I, I can't wait to have in-person stuff again. I just want to thank the Alliance, all of you that make this uh, great <laughs> transportation alliance work. Thank you for advocating uh, and please, our door's open. Call us. Uh, if you have an idea that you think we've missed, we're all ears. Okay? Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Okay. So, um, let's see. We did have... I'm here. Oh, <laughs> there you are. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. How are you? To have Jim Hagedorn, who represents the first district, uh, joining us to, um, as you know, the big topic of the week, the infrastructure package and how we can move forward with reauthorizing the FAST Act. Um, so thank you very much for being here and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Margaret. I appreciate you and all the members of the Alliance for being on the call and inviting me to speak. and to uh, you know, have a nice conversation back and forth. It's great to uh, follow my colleague, uh, Tom Emmer, who I've learned a lot from. He's the Dean of our Republican side of the Minnesota delegation. And also my colleague, uh, Pete Stauber, who's on the Committee of Jurisdiction here, very important. I happen to represent Southern Minnesota, which is mostly a rural, mostly agriculture. Although we've got over 100,000 jobs indirect and direct tied to medical care in our district, which is quite something. Uh, but we, uh, you know, I'm being somebody who serves on the Agriculture Committee, I can tell you how important transportation is to our daily lives, especially folks here in the rural areas and then people that want to transport their goods, particularly to, to market when it comes harvest season and every day in our, in our district uh, when we're moving animals and other things to market. So it's very important. Um, I'm somebody that likes to focus on roads and bridges and the basics and make sure that we have quality roads and bridges, that our airports are in good condition, uh, locks and dams. It doesn't get a lot of play out there, but uh, part of a coalition of members, both Republican and Democrat, who are looking up and down the Mississippi River to make sure those locks and dams are in good shape. I spoke with the Corps of Engineers just a couple weeks ago and said, what, what's it going to take to make sure that the uh, locks and dams in Winona and Houston County and in, in, in Winona and Houston County right on the river there in my district are upgraded and they said you know usually it's about 80 million dollars in maintenance and dredging and everything else and it's very important that we keep them upgraded some of those uh, locks and dams are upwards of 100 years old so we can't have them failing and having our our grain and other uh, goods you know sitting on the dock and having big problems as we as we move into the uh, winter season, perhaps next year. So we don't want that to happen. Uh, you know, rail, pipelines, trucks, they're all connected. And one of the concerns I have with the latest administration is the way they went right out there and started targeting the Keystone pipeline. We have others that don't want to, you know, uh, upgrade pipelines in Northern Minnesota. And that's not good. That's not good on a lot of levels because first of all, it's more efficient to move crude oil uh, through pipelines, more safe to do that. And then when the pipelines get shut down and they're not uh, completed, that means more oil on truck and rail. And if that happens, then it again, limits the capacity for farmers and others and it drives up costs needlessly. And again, it's just not safe. I and mean, we, we see the accidents that occur, it's not a good thing. So I would hope that everybody on the call, those are, you know, fellow members from Minnesota, would uh, encourage the Biden administration to change their rules on the Keystone Pipeline. I know there's a lawsuit going on that, but I think it'll be good for, for all, of, all of us if we do those things. Some of the important uh, projects in our district, well, last year we were happy to work uh, in bipartisan fashion with Governor Walls, with Commissioner Keller, all the folks uh, in the legislature and up and down the corridor there uh, for Highway 14. Uh, to work with the Trump administration, get a $25 million bill grant uh, to work and partner with the state money in order to complete the Highway 14 corridor. That, that uh, 
construction project will be from Nicollet to New Ulm. It's a big deal for the folks that live there. It's a big deal for Southern Minnesota. It's gonna help with safety and the economics and everything else. And boy, for the city of New Ulm, it's, uh, it's long overdue, about 50 years overdue. And we were happy to be a part of that and to work together, like I said, in bipartisan fashion. We we're also happy to get a, um, a grant to uh, upgrade the track for the Ellison Eastern Short Line Railroad that services in our district, Rock and Nobles County, that will help uh, to make sure that the trains can move a little faster, get the goods in a, to market in a timely fashion, connect up with the other railroads and, and get them across the country. And then uh, looking forward, lots of projects in the district, but uh, I know the city of Rochester has spoken with Mayor Norton and others about making sure that we can alleviate congestion and make things better for Rochester's downtown. That's a thriving, growing community, one of the greatest cities in America now as it expands. And of course, uh, the Mayo Clinic that I know so well, uh, they kind of go hand in hand in a lot of ways, but we want to make sure that uh, we keep welcoming uh, travel from around the world. I, we call it medical tourism in Rochester, and that's transportation, very important to that as is what's going on with the airport in Rochester, need to upgrade the lighting system and the runways. Uh, a lot of people don't know it, but the Mayo Clinic handles millions and millions and millions of tests and samples. And of course, there are transplant uh, uh, you know, organs and so forth that are flying in there and they have to get into that airport in all conditions. So got to upgrade the lighting, upgrade the runways to make sure that we can facilitate that. In Mankato, we have the busiest airport in Minnesota without a control tower. So we're working with them to either have a digital or a physical control tower and to upgrade the runways and the taxiways there. And then hey, look, we, we don't leave anybody out. I was just at the Jackson airport about a month or so ago talking with the folks that run that place. And uh, they've got a situation where we need to repave that runway over in New Ulm, we talked with their folks about the crosswind runway. So we're involved in the district and we're getting around and talking to folks and we're going to prior, prioritize some of those projects and hope we can get them funded. Lastly, I'd say I agree with the uh, previous two gentlemen that uh, broadband's very important and that uh, when it comes to these taxes, uh, I don't like the way they've been looking at the mileage tax and so forth for the rural folks. It's kind of a, it's it's a hardship and I don't think that would be uh, that'd be right for them. But I appreciate what you do. Transportation is so important to us, and hopefully we'll keep working together and improve our quality, quality of life, not just in the big cities, but all across uh, Minnesota. So thank you. Right. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, I know a big topic is kind of the, the process when it comes to some of these specific projects that people are interested in. Do you, does your office have um, a process or a form or, or things uh, to help uh, solicit some of these projects? So, uh, of course, we're open to making sure that we prioritize and we get the information to the committees and we advocate for, our, like I said, our cities and the various projects. We'll be working uh, cooperatively with the state to make sure that, uh, you know, we're doing what, what works best for everybody there as well. Uh, I think the best thing would just be to contact our office uh, ask for uh, either uh, Chris Fazicki, who's our uh, chief of staff, or Kyle Perone, who works specifically on this, or Noah Giannis, our, uh, our legislative director. Any of those folks can, can help and we'll move through the process. But I've spoken with a lot of people directly and uh, look to continue to do that. So yeah, we're, we're going to make sure we advocate for the district. Great. Um, and another topic uh, we talked about a little bit earlier is uh, transit funding and just wondering if um, you have any thoughts about uh, increasing funding and looking at the issue of the mileage reimbursement for volunteer drivers since that is an IRS issue, if there's any way to make progress yeah. on that. Well, I, I think if I remember right in the last Congress there was legislation and I signed on to that. We've sent letters. Uh, I certainly you know, don't support that. I think it was one of those unintended things in the tax bill that kind of slipped through the cracks and people didn't realize what was going on. So no, we don't want to discourage folks from volunteering their time. I mean, they do it every day for our veterans, for our elderly folks. It, it makes a big deal. It's a big difference for people out here, whether it's to get groceries or whatever. And uh, we want to make sure we don't ever discourage that. And we we help people, as Congressman Stauber said, in many instances, it helps people remain in their homes and it gives them the best uh, and longest life uh, possible. So we'll, we'll keep working on that one. Hopefully that's something. And uh, if they do have a, a big tax bill or whatever, they can get that straightened out. I, I may not be able to vote for it, but we'll, <laughs> hopefully it'll get straightened out. 
And as far as uh, local transit, you know, we've always been very supportive for folks in the local areas to have options in order to get around. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to do that as best we can. Okay, great. Well, thank you again so much for joining us today. Uh, we definitely want to work with you um, as things move forward. And hopefully we can get a new authorization of the FAST Act before the end of September so we don't have any delays and we don't have to deal with all these short-term extensions. So we really appreciate your time. That, that, would, be a, that would be a good hope. I, hope. I hope we can all work together. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But, you know, my philosophy is get as, get as much of this money from the federal government into the states. Let Governor Walls work with the legislature and the people closest and have the best understanding of it. But. In the meantime, when we have these other projects, these bigger deals, uh, the control tower or whatever at Mankato or the runway at uh, at uh, Rochester, the project in downtown Rochester, I'm happy to work with locals and make sure we, uh, we front for the district. So thanks very much for your time. It's great to be with you. Yeah, thank you. And hopefully we'll see you in September. I look forward to it. Okay, so uh, we also have uh, just been joined by Representative Dean Phillips. Um, so we're very happy to have him with us. Um, and if I can. Hey, everybody. Figure out how to. Oh, there he is. Great. Thank you so much, Representative Phillips, for joining us today. Um, we are very excited, of course, about the big announcement tomorrow for uh, an infrastructure package and are interested in your views on how you see that unfolding and if we will be able to get a reauthorization of the FAST Act before the end of September when it expires. So really appreciate you joining us and I will turn it over to you. There's an infrastructure plan being released tomorrow? <laughs> Ha ha ha. Hey, well, nice to see everybody, most importantly. Margaret, thank you for the invitation. Uh, to my fellow members of the delegation who are speaking and uh, will continue to after me. You know, I, I, I can only imagine how many infrastructure weeks uh, all of you have participated in over the years, how much energy, sweat, and tears you've shed uh, in the spirit of improving our nation's infrastructure. So the good news is, to your point, Margaret, uh, looks like we might finally be in a position uh, to get it done. Uh, I'm sure. I'm not the first to say there's bipartisan agreement on the need, unfortunately not on how to pay for it. And that's been the lifelong challenge, but I think there's intention uh, and a willingness to um, overcome the obstacles this time around uh, and do so. So I wanna thank you all for your advocacy and frankly, patience. Uh, but I'm gonna start with something that's not about uh, bricks and mortar type infrastructure. It's frankly the infrastructure uh, of our democracy. And no matter how, promising the infrastructure bill might be, uh, how strong the economy might reemerge after COVID. Uh, the fact is we also need to improve the infrastructure uh, in our country relative to democracy. Uh, January 6th uh, was an extraordinarily uh, destructive uh, day in our nation's history. Uh, whether you watched it on television screens unfold, I can only imagine how horrifying it was for those of you uh, who were watching from home. And those of us who were literally in the chamber that day, uh, it changed us forever. It reminds us of the fragility of our democracy and how nonsensical uh, the conspiracy theories and the divisions and the discord, uh, and frankly, the political industrial complex uh, uh, has become in our country. And I'm on a mission more than anything else uh, to address that and bring some repair, some respect, some conversation, and most importantly, some cooperation uh, back to an institution uh, that is almost devoid of it, uh, as you all know. So the infrastructure bill that's forthcoming, I do have high hopes for. And I'm sure my Republican colleagues have expressed uh, dismay about the lack of participation uh, uh, amongst rank and file members, especially in the minority. The fact is uh, that's comprehensive uh, and collective on both sides of the aisle. Uh, rank and file members have not had the opportunity, in my estimation, to participate in the way that most of us want to. Democrats and Republicans, uh, and that's part of my mission as well. I'm the vice chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, 28 Democrats, 28 uh, Republicans who are committed to working together, returning to regular order, ensuring minority rights, and ensuring that members of Congress actually participate in these processes rather than having them imposed on all of us. And I do think this is a golden opportunity, frankly, for that kind of bipartisan cooperation. And we will most assuredly uh, be uh, expressing that. Uh, and leveraging 
uh, our unique position right now uh, with a very slim majority of Democrats in the House and Senate uh, to affect it. Uh, so that's why a conversation like this is important and I'm eager to hear from you too relative to your, uh, your hopes and uh, desires relative to what emerges. Uh, for me, broadband, uh, despite living in a suburban district uh, that is generally well covered uh, by high-speed internet, uh, COVID has laid bare the fact that there is grave inequities uh, and not just in rural areas, but even in, in suburban areas uh, that have to be rectified. Uh, kids are unable to learn, people are unable to fulfill their remote work uh, responsibilities, uh, and we're falling behind as a nation. Uh, and that has to be complemented, of course, with uh, roads, bridges, airports, electric grid, and other. Our water infrastructure, another issue our mayors bring to me uh, with great regularity and great concern, uh, has to be part of this, of course. And highway improvements. I mean, I got Highway 12 and 5 and 55 and 610 and 494, the list goes on and on. Uh, but my hope is that we will both improve the nation's infrastructure uh, and create uh, a thriving economy with some good paying jobs uh, to boot, uh, but all in the spirit of investment. Uh, if we continue to look at it as cost rather than investment, we will continue to fall behind as other countries around the world you know, rapidly improve their infrastructure to be more competitive. Uh, and that is a risk to us. Uh, so we all agree on the need. We've got to discuss how to pay for it. And um, that's something important to me, uh, how we pay for this. Our nation now is approaching a $30 trillion federal debt, uh, which is troublesome, of course. Uh, but it's the fact that we're almost uh, up to $500 billion a year in our debt service, the interest that we are paying on that debt, which almost, almost at the point now where we're paying more for the past than we are investing in the future. And in a conversation like this that is contingent, uh, on the future, uh, there is a grave concern amongst many of us that we are increasingly uh, unable to pay for out of the uh, annual budget some of the needs our country needs, health, education, infrastructure, uh, you name it. And so we have to do better. Uh, with all of that, um, you know, the solvency of the Highway Trust Fund, uh, uh, imperative, uh, and of course, community pr project funding uh, are uh, issues back finally uh, under the new name. It doesn't actually roll off the tongue the same way the old name rolled off the tongue, of course, but that's what we're there to do, to listen, to learn, to advocate for the projects important to our districts. Uh, it also gives me hope because I think that by so doing, uh, we will actually generate bipartisanship because if you have to work together in order to bring home the resources to get projects done, uh, that's a darn good incentive uh, in an institution that needs both carrots and sticks. So with that, I think I will uh, turn it back over to you. And um, if there's anything that you want to share with us offline, online, uh, my chief of staff, Zach Rodvold, is on the call as well. Uh, I'm here to listen and learn and uh, not impose anything. But if we don't work together, rest assured, uh, it will be imposed on all of us. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Margaret, and uh, happy to entertain any questions. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, I guess, you know, one of the biggest questions is just the, the funding, as always. And um, it sounds like the administration is not interested in increasing the fuel tax or looking at a mileage based user fee. Do you see um, taxes on corporations or high earners or what do you see in terms of some kind of pay fors for this? You know, Margaret, I, you know, Senator Wyden has a proposition forthcoming to restructure the international tax system to help pay for it. I favor infrastructure banks. Uh, you know, I think there are ways that we should be considering to do so. And at the end of the day, I mean, I, I, I hope I, I'm, I don't think I'm alone in, in this perspective and that you know, we have to um, identify revenues to match our investment needs, period. Uh, and that means those in a position to do so have a responsibility as Americans uh, to pay a fair share. Uh, and that is, that's a simple truth. Um, I don't have a distinct opinion yet on specifics, but there's no question. Uh, we have the carried interest loophole for you know, uh, hedge fund managers out of New York who are earning hundreds of millions of dollars a year, paying 20% tax rates essentially uh, on what I really consider income, not capital gains. Uh, that's a great distinction. Uh, whether our nation considers some type of an asset tax, just as we already pay in property tax, uh, which we do not have at the federal level, you know, I, I'm a business person. I think you all know that. Uh, I want people to have blue sky opportunities as entrepreneurs. But uh, the inequities that have developed relative to income, relative, relative to wealth, and frankly, relative to infrastructure uh, are so grave and I think are posing an extraordinary risk uh, to the country's future. Uh, uh, it's, it's very existence, mind you. So I do think there 
we have reached a point where we have to consider uh, some new 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 lenses on on uh, raising revenue uh, through taxation without compromising our ability to be competitive with the rest of the world. But uh, we have too many. We have a growing uh, and very uh, troublesome uh, gap between the haves and a growing number of have-nots, uh, which is a real risk to our country. Uh, and I think we can have a more equitable, favorable, fair tax system. Uh, and this is a great opportunity to investigate it and make some propositions. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know you know um, how much uh, the need is here in Minnesota for all sorts of projects. And I know folks are really uh, happy to see more opportunity for groups to apply for funding for specific projects. Um, so I'm sure you'll be hearing um, from folks and we um, appreciate having your staff on. Um, Representative Angie Craig has just joined us and I think she's on kind of a tight timeline. So um, if it's okay with you, I think we'll um, introduce her. And if you wanna stick around, uh, you certainly can, but otherwise we uh, definitely appreciate your time and hope to see you hopefully in September we can go out to Washington DC and for our fly-in and hopefully we can see you in person and talk more about these issues. Well, thank, thank you Margaret thank you all uh, I'll, I'll keep my closing remarks to at least uh, just 25 minutes or so so I can um, take all of Angie's time <laughs> nonetheless thank you and you know keep the faith uh, keep in touch and keep your ideas coming not just about what we need to do but help us determine how to do it uh, in a way that brings people together, and makes it equitable and fair, and most of all, you know, brings back American innovation and possibility uh, in a way that I think we all need to invest in uh, psychologically and financially. So with that, uh, I wish you all Godspeed. Thanks for the invitation, and I will tune out. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so, um... We do have with us, we're very happy to have uh, Representative Angie Craig, who uh, represents the second district and did serve on transportation last year, um, but we know that it's an issue you care a lot about. Uh, and we're very pleased to have you to hear your thoughts on what will happen uh, this year with infrastructure and trying to get the FAST Act reauthorized before it expires at the end of September. So I will turn it over to you and thank you again for joining us. Well, Margaret, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be with you. And of course, always an honor to follow my uh, good friend and colleague, Dean Phillips, who he and I are uh, incredibly like-minded uh, and uh, really work incredibly well together. Uh, he's a chairman of a subcommittee on the House Committee on Small Business where I serve. In addition, uh, I serve on the House Agriculture Committee, which also makes me incredibly interested in rural development uh, and rural projects, infrastructure and transportation projects. And then of course, uh, my big committee assignment this session uh, and new assignment is the Energy and Commerce Committee where about 60% of the legislation that comes through the US House flows. So uh, it's already been an incredibly busy uh, 117th Congress. You know, I came to Congress, uh, many of you I've met with a number of times, and you know, I came to Congress because I wanted to work to lower the cost of healthcare and prescription drugs, and I wanted to fix the damn roads uh, in the second district and across Minnesota, that I long believe that um, we are falling behind as a nation with the lack of investment in infrastructure. And as someone who too, like Dean, came from the private sector before I ran for public office, um, you know, I've traveled uh, all over. I spent about half of my time outside the U.S. in my last five years as an executive with St. Jude Medical. And what uh, I noticed most of all uh, was just the lack of infrastructure investment in our nation. What I also know from personal experience at St. Jude Medical is that private sector uh, growth often follows public sector investment. So for all of those reasons, I think... Uh, this opportunity in the 117th Congress is enormous. Um, we have an administration who is uh, absolutely committed to investing in infrastructure. And I think, um, you know, I, I certainly would love to see us be able to build bipartisan support uh, for a transportation and infrastructure bill. I think that there are an awful lot of components of many of the proposals uh, that already have been offered 
um, where we do have good bipartisan support. Things like investing in our highways, our roads, our bridges, and in particular broadband uh, coming out of this pandemic. So uh, I'm working uh, in particular with uh, representatives from state government, from county government, local governments here in the second district to make sure that uh, I know exactly what the priority projects are for the second district. I'm also uh, working with organizations like yours and with organized labor to make sure that we have uh, the right skills and the right skill level as we implement these particular projects. So um, I look forward to hearing from our stakeholders on this call. We've got a, uh, an internal deadline uh, coming up uh, on April 7th. We've asked uh, folks to apply for um, uh, these particular projects to our office to be considered for inclusion in the transportation and infrastructure bill. And that submission process um, uh, uh, closes on April the 16th, I believe. And we have a member day hearing on April 14th where I plan to testify uh, to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee under the leadership of uh, Chairman DeFazio. So, my office is also participating uh, in the new community projects funding process as well, which is being run separately as part of the Appropriations Committee. What I will tell you is that uh, the way things were done in the old world in Congress, I'm glad to see that additional guardrails were put in place for these projects. And my office intends to put further guardrails in place uh, as we look uh, for these submissions uh, really that uh, are uh, uh, government submissions. These are projects that uh, have been reviewed at the county level, at the state level, um, projects that are shovel ready and ready to go. So finally, um, you know, I just wanted to point out that we're thinking of infrastructure a little more broadly. As a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee last session, I was part of putting together the Moving Forward Act but Lift America is the bill that uh, is under consideration by the Energy and Commerce Committee. We just introduced this bill two weeks ago and we're thinking about uh, additional infrastructure like health infrastructure, um, even information systems infrastructure. So a little bit even beyond uh, your traditional highways, roads and bridges that you would typically see uh, come out of a congressional district like this. Uh, that would invest about 312 billion in uh, clean and efficient energy, safe drinking water, expanded access to broadband, brownfield cleanups, and improving our nation's healthcare infrastructure. So all of these things are coming through uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee. So as I said, I'm hopeful uh, that this Congress uh, can get to some sort of bipartisan commitment to an infrastructure investment. Um, Margaret, the question you asked Dean, uh, you know, sometimes these uh, challenges, we may all agree on the needed investment in infrastructure, but uh, where we raise the funds to pay for these things, uh, you know, whether that comes from uh, federal fuel tax, uh, whether we look at a model, which obviously there are some pilot programs running today around uh, vehicle miles traveled, something uh, that, uh, you know, I think shows some um, medium term promise, um, you know, how in fact we make the investments we need to make. And then, of course, um, the last thing I'll say is that I really viewed the American Rescue Plan um, in, in, the, in exactly as it was called. It was a rescue package intended to help uh, our state, local governments, our counties um, recover lost revenue and not have to tax uh, taxpayers more as a result of a public health crisis. I view this very much as a stimulus plan intended to put people to work, uh, intended to stimulate growth. And um, I'm looking at it in that way. And of course, the devil's always in the details of any piece of legislation, particularly at one as big as this is intended to be. And, um, you know, my suspicion is it will get through the House. And the real question will be uh, over in the Senate, whether we put a package together that can get to 60 votes, or whether there is uh, some other mechanism needed uh, to pass this. But I'm going to end here. Uh, I know all of you on this call most of all uh, are tired of hearing us talk about the need for infrastructure investment, at least the people in my district. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, it's uh, not, a, not a political question. Um, you know, people are tired of the talk from Washington. What they wanna see is investment in action. And so 
I intend to, to work as part of that. And uh, I think we're gonna get something done this session. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, if you have time for a couple questions. Um, I do. You okay. ask all the hard, save all the hard ones for Senator Klobuchar though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a question about a second train between St. Paul and Chicago. Um, is that something that you see federal support for? Yeah, I, I, I do think that's going to happen, uh, in fact. And so, you know, I've got the, the, the great uh, river communities in the second congressional district and Red Wing uh, is part of, uh, part of that. And uh, that, I think that's, that's going to make it. That's going to happen. So, uh, you know, I think uh, passenger rail, um, you know, is, uh, is something that uh, will really uh, help boost uh, the economy here. And I, I do think we can make that happen. Great. Um, another question uh, that has come up, uh, what do you see in terms of funding for research into transportation? Um, you know, with the Center for Transportation Studies here, um, it's an area that doesn't always get a lot of attention. Um, just wondering about that. And then also what you see in terms of uh, transit funding for uh, bigger projects uh, in the states. Margaret, there are uh, there there are two things. One, um, I, I I do see the need uh, to take a more strategic uh, view of America's transportation systems. As someone who's uh, uh, you know uh, visited a lot of different uh, places, um, you know our reliance on the highway system, uh, you know, and over reliance as we're sharing it with uh, with with big trucks and. Uh, you know, lack of, of, of truck parking uh, along the way, I think it's become a, a real issue. And so I do support additional funding uh, for that research. And um, I, I, I think there, I'll have to go back with to my LD and get back to you on the number um, that is proposed inside the Moving Forward Act. But uh, I do think that that is a significant area uh, that uh, the Transportation Secretary, Mr. Buttigieg, is going to uh, take a strong look at. Um, and then uh, your your final question um, was remind me, Margaret. I'm sorry, I got lost in my own answer. That's okay. Um, bigger transit projects, you know, the capital investment grants for transit. Uh, there's so much interest now in bus rapid transit in Minnesota and building out that network. Uh, do you see a significant increase in funding for that? I, I do think bus rapid transit in particular is critical uh, for investment and I'll be making a strong push uh, for my own congressional district related to that. Now that also creates some issues. You know, I always think about uh, highway uh, uh, interstate 35 as you go around the curve in Lakeville. Uh, when I talk about bus rapid transit uh, and the need for investment in that interstate. And so I'm going to keep pushing. I, I do think that's an area for expansion and expanded funding. Um, there's also just, you know, as we all know, a lot of remediation that needs to happen uh, from, a, uh, you know, highways, roads, and bridges perspective. Uh, and one of the areas I'll be particularly focused on is to make sure that our uh, rural communities, that greater Minnesota doesn't get left out of this discussion. So uh, when my staff and I think about this, you know, for some of you who aren't from the second, um, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a little bit uh, urban, it's a lot suburban, uh, it's uh, very exurban, and then 65% uh, of this district, if you're just looking at a map of it, it, is growing corn or soybeans. So that tells you that uh, just, you know, how much rural area there is. And I see that as someone who grew up in rural America myself, it's just a huge untapped potential uh, for the ag community, I see it as a huge uh, opportunity for, um, you know, the, the, to sort of take what has happened during the pandemic and make major investment in making sure we have broadband throughout our state, throughout this district, opening up the opportunity to, to live in places that uh, people, uh, you know, haven't thought about living in with a little more land and uh, really uh, you can create a business anywhere. Um, with, uh, with internet. So I, I just see the convergence of all of these factors being incredibly exciting to a congressional district like mine. And all of this uh, investment in infrastructure is absolutely critical uh, to make sure that we reach our full potential throughout the state. 
Well, thank you so much. I know you're you're busy, so we don't want to take up too much of your time, but we really do appreciate you being here today. And we look forward to working with you. Uh, we know this is going to take a while, and uh, so we will definitely be in touch. And hopefully we can go out to DC in September and talk to you in person. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to have some good news on getting a new Surface Transportation Authorization Act. I, I think we're going to get it across the finish line, Margaret, and I look forward to working with all of you to make sure we're making the right investments in Minnesota. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, our other uh, couple of our members, our senators, um, sent us some videos, uh, some short videos, because they were not able scheduling wise to be with us. Um, so, but we do have April Jones uh, with us. Um, so I'm going to introduce April. Um, we can find her. Um, and uh, she's here to help answer questions. And we're going to start with um, showing a video. Um, oh, there she is. So um, Hi. there's April. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. So she has all the answers, um, but we're going to start by showing a video if we can get this to work because technology is um, sometimes a little challenging, but um, we're going to try the screen share and uh, see if we can get this video. Oh, great. Here we go. Hello, everyone attending the Minnesota Transportation Alliance Forum, and thanks, Margaret, for inviting me to join all of you today, virtually, of course, but maybe not next year. In fact, I know not next year because I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Or as I said up in Duluth, the mayor said, I see the lighthouse in the distance. Thank you for allowing me to join you once again to celebrate the work you do every day to keep Minnesota moving. At a time when the pandemic has had a devastating impact on our public transportation, it's more important than ever that we invest in infrastructure to help connect Minnesotans to work, to school, to their communities, and of course, to support our economic growth. With the vaccine distributions ramping up, we know we're gonna make it through this. We're gonna round the corner of the pandemic, and it's vital that we look ahead to ensure that our economy is able to bounce back, not only to where it was, but even better than before. And by the way, that's where infrastructure comes in. I think you know that when I ran for president, the first policy plan I put out, because all the work I've done with all of you over the years was on infrastructure. And I'm so pleased that President Biden has emphasized that investment in infrastructure as one of the top priorities for his administration. And I look forward to working with my colleagues in the Democratic side and across the aisle to get this done. Because we all know too many bridges are in need of fixing. We know that too many roads still have potholes. Too many rail tracks need fixing. We need help with everything from water infrastructure to our dams, to our locks and dams, you name it. No state knows better than Minnesota how important it is to have a safe, reliable transportation system. We made, sadly, international news on August 1st, 2007, when the I-35W collapsed, taking the lives of 13 and injuring so many more. And as I said that day, a bridge should not just fall down in the middle of America, especially not an eight-lane highway, one of the most traveling, heavily traveled bridges in our state, not at rush hour, not six blocks from my house. That was a major game changer for me. And I was new in the Senate, and I know back then we got the money we needed to fix that bridge, but that was just the beginning. I've taken on infrastructure ever since then. In 2015, we took a big step forward when we passed the FAST Act. I was the second Democrat on that bill after Barbara Boxer. And what happened then? Well, we've gotten money for many, many important projects in Minnesota. You know the road expansions. You know what we've done. Uh, with the light rail. You know what we've done with rapid buses. You know what we've done with our bike trails um, and all the work we've done on pedestrian trails. Um, I'm really proud of what we've done in our state with this combination of state, federal, county, and city help. But you know there's so many challenges, like the Blatnik Bridge, Highways 212 and Highway 169. Um, we've got work still to do on Highway 14. We know that, but we've done a lot of work so far. 
Uh, we've got the build grant, just by the way, for Highway 14 and for Highway 10. But we know, I know, literally, I can think of a city and I can think of the projects and the help that you need. We need to ensure that the Highway Trust Fund will be able to support the current spending levels so that states and cities can take on transportation projects without worrying that their funding will run out. But earlier this month, the Congressional Budget Office projected that without additional funding by the summer of 2022, the trust fund will become insolvent. That could result in the DOT delaying payments to states and transit agencies for work they've already completed. This matters here in Minnesota, where our long winter leaves us with a relatively short construction season. I don't have to tell you that. We simply can't afford to pull back on funds. Meanwhile, Freight rail keeps our businesses and state economy moving forward, and we must ensure the safety of our rail lines. That's why I supported the Twin Cities and Western Rail Company's successful application for a more than $2 million grant to strengthen our rail infrastructure. I also supported the Federal Transit Administration's decision to allocate more than $74 million for further construction of the Metro Orange Line bus rapid transit project. From the airport to Twins Games, the Metro is bringing our community closer together. And last year, I announced that the Department of Transportation would fully fund Southwest Rail. Once completed, that line will make such a difference. And well, by the way, we know there's more to come. We know we need to do get that line done finally um, to uh, the northern suburbs. You know the work we'd like to do on the rail uh, to Duluth, uh, the North Star Line, to St. Cloud that needs to be extended. And we need to do more when it comes to Rochester. I love rail. I've told some of you this. It's the only way my husband and I can take a vacation without getting into an argument about directions. But overall, I think that rail is so important to the future as we look at changes of climate change. What else needs to be done? Well, we've got to make sure that we don't end there. We've got to look at and work with President Biden on the future. I'm leading the infrastructure broadband bill. I'm going to be working as a member of the Commerce Committee and putting together a major package. This is about moving our country forward and building a 21st century economy by investing in 21st century transportation. Thank you. I couldn't have done what I've done or will do without you at my side and without hearing from all of you with ideas, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and what we can do most importantly to make things better and, to use Joe's words, build back better. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, we want to uh, have all of you, uh, don't be shy, ask questions for April. Um, and maybe we can just start out with, um, what have you been hearing in the Senate as far as um, being able to uh, give money to specific projects or earmarks? Um, is the, is, has there been a decision? It sounds like there's been more progress in the House. Yeah, Margaret, thanks. That's right. And, and thanks for having me. Um, as you all know, the Senator uh, absolutely loves to um, join you all in this event. I think every year, um, I've been with her for over two years now and know that it is something we typically do, but she is not in a place where she can get service. So, um, you know, Zoom has its benefits, but right now, um, not so much. So, so thanks for having me and just, um, yeah, happy to help and, and provide any insight. Um, to your question, yeah, I think in terms of like specific projects, the House has of, of course had more um, progress. I think right now in the Senate, we're still in, in discussions about, um, you know, where Republicans are. I think, you know, it's no secret that the Senator is very supportive of um, being able to get direct funding for particular projects and earmarks. Um, so we've really been pushing for that. And so um, so it's just like, I think the, the discussions are still ongoing, but it, it's certainly a, a top priority for the Senator because it's where, you know, I think we're, we're always very happy to, to write letters of support and make phone calls to the secretaries. And she's been really um, successful in doing that. As she mentioned, several projects, you know, from Southwest Light Rail to Orange Line to just different build grants that we were able to get. Um, so, so that's been, you know, through the, the ways that we have available to us, but really do look forward to, to hopefully being able to, to advocate and get particular projects. Um, so. Okay, 
Um, well, another question uh, that continues to come up, uh, there have been programs, as you know, like BUILD and INFRA, these discretionary grant programs, and I think there's a, a round of BUILDs going on right now. Um, do you see those programs continuing and uh, an opportunity for Minnesota projects to compete with those? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely see that funding continuing. I think, you know, we expect the president to release his infrastructure proposal tomorrow. Um, you know, I think upwards of three trillion dollars. So we're all like on the edge of our seats waiting to see what's included. Um, he he does have a the Build Back Better plan that he released on the campaign, which I think did have increased funding um, for these programs. So I do think that, that this funding is gonna continue to be um, an, an important part um, of, of kind of helping, you know, move projects forward. I, I think, you know, it's critical, especially when I know in Minnesota, so, um, so many of, of, of the counties and just like local communities are putting so much of their own funding in, which I think is really important, but it, you know, it's almost impossible to do it alone. Um, and also, I think, especially for the bridges and stuff that are so incredibly expensive, um, we're, you know, we're, we're abs absolutely big advocates for those programs, the senator is. And so, um, and also, you know, again, we continue to write letters of support. And I think, um, you know, as the application closes, we always work really closely with MnDOT and try and, you know, set up a call for the Senator to call the secretary, which um, now she had a good relationship with Secretary Chow and has an even better, maybe, I don't know, like pretty good relationship with um, Secretary Buttigieg. Um, and I think she just went on like a walk with him the other day. So um, we are certainly using those, those times and opportunities to raise um, really important um, um, you know, projects in, in Minnesota, transportation infrastructure projects that need need funding. So, um, so, so I think we'll, we're absolutely on top of that, but really hoping to see what what comes of the, the discussions with earmarks. But I think those programs are going to be important and just we'll see what what's in the proposal, but fully anticipate that that funding in there. Great. Um, well, we don't have a lot of time left, um, and we do have yeah. a video from um, Senator Smith as well, a short one, but I uh, just wanted to say that we really look forward to working with you this summer um, and want to put in a plug again for making sure that things like research uh, in transportation is included. Mm -hmm. Uh, Greater Minnesota Transit, uh, looking at the mileage reimbursement for volunteer drivers, um, mm -hmm. all of these issues we've talked about in the past, but um, we really appreciate you being here and we will definitely be in touch and we hope to see you in person in September. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yes, absolutely. Here. Yeah, so um, I think I, I see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, so as you all know, just please feel free to email me. Um, I think, you know, Kurt and Rommel in the state, um, just, you know, be in touch. We're happy to be helpful however we can. Any updates you all need, um, support for projects. Um, so, so yeah, and again, sorry the Senator couldn't be here, but, uh, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can here in D.C. Okay. Well, thank right. you so much. We'll Bye. See you. Bye. Okay. So we do have one last um, video uh, that's very short from Senator Smith. So um, I'm going to bring that up. Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Tina Smith. Thank you to Margaret Donahoe and all of the leaders at the Minnesota Transportation Alliance for your work on transportation and infrastructure. You know, we've worked together for a long time, and I know that we need you now more than ever. You are leaders in local government, transportation, labor unions, transit systems, and other organizations. And so you know that a bold federal infrastructure package is long overdue. These investments in infrastructure will expand our economy, improve public safety, and help Minnesotans live their lives. As we emerge from the pandemic and look to the future, let's build back better. 
I'm working hard with my colleagues here in Washington to put together a bipartisan infrastructure package and to reauthorize our nation's surface transportation programs. This is a huge opportunity to jumpstart our economy and create jobs. And as we do this, we need to focus on building towards an economy that is cleaner and more fair for everyone. Last year, we worked together on my bipartisan investments in Rural Transit Act, which would support rural public transportation. So I'm grateful for your input on that, and I look forward to getting this done. Have a great rest of your day, and take care. Okay, um, so again, I just really want to thank everybody uh, for being here. It's really, really important. Uh, even though it does seem like there's a lot of momentum around infrastructure, I think we've all lived through a lot of years where that kind of fizzled amongst uh, disagreement over how to pay for this. So it will be really important for all of you to continue to communicate with members of the congressional delegation. The Transportation Alliance is here to help you with that. Uh, we will be sending our recommendations for reauthorization and we're always happy to share that. Um, and we're also happy to provide sample letters or uh, we'll also probably be sending out action alerts that make it easier for people to communicate uh, with members of the delegation. Um, but again, we just really appreciate you being here uh, because it does make a difference to getting members of Congress to pay attention to this issue. And I also want to put in a last plug, if you can, to join us in Washington, September 21st to the 23rd. We are planning our fly-in and hopefully uh, there will be progress towards uh, doing something with reauthorization so there isn't just another one-year extension of the FAST Act. Um, so again, thank you all. Please have a great day and we will be in touch. Thank you so much.